Okay, so welcome everybody and thank you so much for giving up your evening to be with us. Uh, it's just so exciting for me, I have to express, I'm busy, I'm doing all sorts of stuff, um, but uh, it's so good to know that we have got interested people to do this marine sciences online course with us starting next year and um, or continuing next year because we have had such an, a really interesting experience in dealing with marine sciences in, in this year with the grade tens. And um, it's, it's, the course is going well. I think um, it, it's great. It's, it's working for most people. The one or two people who dropped out, it didn't work well for them. Um, and I think we've learned through the process of, of dealing with this uh, curriculum really nicely and really well. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to give you a good background into the, two, into the um, marine sciences curriculum and hopefully answer some of your questions. But um, just by way of introduction, um, my name is Russell Stevens. The kids called me Mr. Rusty when I was out there teaching many years ago. Taught, um, so yeah, 40 years teaching experience, experience in environmental education in the main. I've been at the aquarium for over 20 years. Um, we have recently been involved in developing learning programs and most particularly um, the marine sciences curriculum. Wow, this has been quite a journey because Xavier, who I'll introduce you to as well, he has taught, um, he should probably introduce himself, um, but a well-experienced high school teacher has uh, done everything that any high school life sciences teacher could do. He also headed up the um, matric group at, at one of the schools in the, in, in, in Cape Town. And so what we're sitting with is an amazing amount of experience. I, I lean on Xavier and vice versa. Really grateful to have um, one of our colleagues here, Anzio. Can't see everybody in the chat, so maybe there are some others from the aquarium team who are on, um, who, who's sitting in. But Anzio is our IT come teacher, come outreach teacher, and he does amazing stuff for us and um, is very patient with me in getting things together. I'm going to launch straight in. Um, if you uh, have a question, please send it in the chat. Um, and Xavier will interpret it for me and interrupt me at some point and then ask the question. Otherwise, we'll just uh, deal with questions right at the very end. So the background to the aquarium's academic engagement. Well, the aquarium was built in 1995 and they found that people used to go in school groups and there wasn't really a focus on the animals and the, the, the work that we were doing. So we ended up designing a classroom, a wet lab, where school groups could visit. There was then a demand from the, the districts and the education department to run enrichment courses. So we ran enrichment courses and then siblings wanted enrichment courses for younger and for older students. And so it ended up that we developed what we call the Marine Sciences Academy. And as a result of that, we developed quite a lot of courses with a lot of content. And then we had a person from the district saying, why don't you develop a curriculum? And that is then what we did. We also approached um, concerned university lecturers about where the gaps were in the education system that they felt needed to be filled in from a school perspective. So this marine sciences curriculum has uh, developed out of our 
input from universities, our input from schools, out of our experience. And we know that the South Africa has needed a marine sciences focus in the marine sciences curriculum. In developing the process, we consulted widely. We went to the Department of Basic Education. That's the minister's department in education, the independent examination board, and to Umalusi, the body that oversees both the IEB and the Department of Basic Education. We discussed this course with uh, subject specialists, subject specialists in physics, in geography, in life sciences, both in the Western Cape, as well as in uh, Gauteng. And um, that was our main focus. We did have connections with uh, subject advisors in KwaZulu-Natal, as well as subject advisors in the Eastern Cape. But the main group of subject advisors that grappled with the content and pulled the content together were in Gauteng and the Western Cape. Um, we also consulted authors of other um, curricula, such as the Equine Studies, Nautical Sciences, and Maritime Economics. We discussed the curriculum with district directors, with teachers, formal education people from the Department of Correctional Services, and as you'll see, the four main provinces that we focused on were from uh, Western Cape, Gauteng, Eastern Cape, and KwaZulu-Natal. We then wrote this curriculum in 2016, between the 26th of January and the 31st of May, and then we put it out to a group of advisors from universities. We also put it out to the marine scientific community and the marine, the South African marine education community. People all who, who were, had the opportunity to give comments and to give us guidance as to how we could change the curriculum or do some different, um, have a different focus to the curriculum. So when we wrote it, this slide probably should be earlier, um, we consulted what does exist out there instead of reinventing the wheel. And we had a look at what is found in particularly Queensland, less so New South Wales in Australia, Chile, Belgium, the United Kingdom, they've got a Cambridge curriculum, but it's only taught in Singapore, Sweden, um, the United States, Japan, Bangladesh, and Canada. I realize I've got a different flag here, and I don't know. I've got Chile written twice, and I wonder which flag I'm referring to here. It suffices to say, lots of people were consulted from a range of communities. After writing it, we got endorsements from those, um, those countries, as well as from a group of people at the universities. Um, George Branch, for example, is somebody who's a, a definitive author in South Africa. Um, but basically from UCT, UWC, CPUT in Cape Town, uh, UKZN, Nelson Mandela University, um, University of Tokyo, Chittagong, Taiwan, University of Berkeley in the USA, University of Connecticut, and then, as I've mentioned, the four universities of the Western Cape. So we've consulted widely and we've had endorsements from really respectable people from around the planet in terms of ocean literacy and marine sciences education. I get asked over and over, I had a radio interview this afternoon, in fact, and the first question was, is marine sciences really a matric subject? 
Well, uh, a year ago, I said yes, because it was, it had gone through Parliament. But now it is absolutely written into the South African law. The Government Gazette, if you have a look on it, 27 November 2020, it is there in that gazette. And um, I'm going backwards, my apologies. And uh, here is the mention of marine sciences signed by the Minister of Basic Education. Um, your question might also be is can I go into university with marine sciences as a subject? Marine sciences is listed in that very same government gazette with the other main science subjects and it's given a number it's called a CMIS number or an EMIS number. The subject has a, an official number and this um, if anybody at any any of your schools uh, has to question, no, this can't be a subject. That is the Gazette you referred to. It's an amendment to the South African Schools Act, 27 of November, 2020. There are marine sciences nerds currently teaching the subject. Um, South Peninsula High, Hans by Simonstown High, Protea Heights in Brackenfell, Melkbos Strunt, and from next year, Grudeskir High will be a nerd school. Um, these are all at Port Nolith, Durban, Mpangeni. Um, these are all schools where it is a subject being offered in the school time. So between eight in the morning and uh, two o'clock, you'll find the subject marine sciences being taught. So there will be first uh, home language, first additional language, plus another four subjects of which marine sciences will be one and life sciences the seventh. The offering that we offer as a, an online facility is to offer marine sciences as an eighth subject. Just as these marine sciences node schools, they offer marine sciences as a an eighth subject as well, after school hours, and you can consult those schools to do so. Some of them are finding that it's very odious to fit offering marine sciences as, as a subject at their nerd school. And so we as the Two Oceans Aquarium have agreed that we would take on students that they have who are their eighth subject students. So what does marine sciences do as a subject? Every subject, history or whatever, and I'll get to history, but later has got key goals. Marine sciences has been thought out as a subject where we build upon your understanding of today and then build new ocean understandings. In essence, with many definitions, and the core knowledge of what we teach, we teach the language of marine sciences. If you were to be able to function in a conversation with confidence about the ocean, you will need certain language that you need to be confident about. You need to know what that means, what, what it implies. We teach you to question the sources of ocean information. That is important for us because if you are not learning through a questioning criterion methodology, you're not learning against the basis of your prior knowledge. You're not considering the research that is um, authentic and has been substantiated. We hope to build the confidence and we are seeing that confidence developing amongst our current students. Um, confident in knowing authentic ocean information, to be able to substantiate ocean information and to debate ocean concepts. Key to learning online, and I believe very strongly that this is something 
which people could learn at our aquarium course is to develop study skills, um, developing skills to become a lifelong learner, a lifelong ocean learner. Um, we trust that you will learn to produce skills that how you can function in the future and do future research. Um, within all of this, you'll find Xavier will show you some fun Z snaps, he calls them. And that is what um, you, you will find extremely interesting. Uh, I've worked with Xavier for many years and I am interested and I find it fun to even hear what he has to say. A key value of marine sciences is that it teaches multidisciplinary thinking. So if you don't study marine sciences at Vasti and you're going to medicine or you're going to law, you will have learned multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary thinking, non-siloed thinking in an approach to a professional um, understanding of things. Very important as to why we are doing what we're doing. The aquarium aims to save the oceans and we need to be informed. There's so much false information, not only about COVID, but about the environment, about climate change, about the oceans. And the, there is no doubt that oceans are sensitive and we need to be sensitive to the ocean ecosystems. And to be able to be sensitive in an informed way. Good. Another question I get asked is how does marine sciences compare to other subjects, be it geography, physical sciences, other languages and so forth. Key is that this subject is designed as a standalone subject, but it's on par with geography, on par with life sciences. Different is that um, this subject is more, it's less taxing probably than physical sciences, but more taxing in, uh, maybe in terms of difficulty, depending on your personality, more difficult than life sciences possibly. Um, in the way we've written it, uh, because, for example, life sciences, no essays are required. We train and teach you how to write um, essays. We, Xavier and I, are passionate. We are passionate ocean teachers. And the, it comes out in the way in which we teach. It comes out in the way in which the students respond to us. And I, that goes for the entire aquarium education team, totally passionate about what they do. I think I've got the same slide twice, let's just see. Yeah, so um, the one thing I wanted to add to that was it is less challenging that, than physical sciences. I'd redone the slide and realized that it was there twice. The other question that I get asked is, um, is there an overlap with other subjects? There is marginally ecosystems. No education core curricula should not teach ecosystems and ecology. In South Africa, life sciences, agricultural sciences, and geography all deal with ecosystems. Um, there is a bit of an overlap with plate tectonics and geography. In life sciences, there's some general biology that is an overlap quite uh, specifically. Um, in physical sciences, in the FET curriculum, waves, light energy, and gas lords are re repeated. However, the way we've designed this in the matricia, in the grade, 12 exam, there's not going to be duplication of other subjects. So you can't prepare for the same 
answer in an exam and produce the same essay or the same paragraph answer in more than one subject. Who should study marine sciences? Well, somebody who is totally stuck indoors in with their books and needs to have a relief. The oceans are the chosen holiday destination and we have the privilege of bringing that into our classroom. Um, for those people who love the ocean, that's really important. For those people who are inspired by the oceans, I'm always so amazed by the people that I've taught in the past and have gone on to be inspired in the difference that they want to, to do. The, the other thing that's really important is we would hope people will study marine sciences in order to make a contribution to the oceans um, and to, to, to give its payback time that we need to understand what is happening in the ocean and we need to be involved in its protection. The ocean is a unit of study. So if you want to go and study marine sciences or oceanography back up at university, what is very, very important, you can take uh, marine sciences and that's a definite, you'll get a definite nod from certainly the universities that we have consulted. So what is the subject about? There are four strands and I've put these on two different levels. The majority is marine biology and understandably marine biology is what most people think uh, marine sciences would be about. But marine biology basically integrates with oceanography, ocean ecosystems, and then the humans and the ocean. And we feel that without the one, you can't deal with the other. In the exam situation, there are two papers, a paper one and a paper two, not in any particular order. It could be paper two and paper one. Paper one deals with oceanography, ocean ecosystems, and humans in the ocean. And paper two, which is also a 150 mark paper, is the marine biology component. The important consideration for next year's online teaching, we are aiming for a Tuesday and Thursday evening session, um, probably from um, half past four to half past six, like we've done this year. On the one day, I teach the oceanography the ocean ecosystems and humans in the ocean. And on the other day, let's say I do Tuesday and Xavier does the, the Thursday or vice versa, he would do the, the marine biology. So that's how we will deal with the um, distilling of that content. So you might not really be sure about what oceanography is about. And here gives you a bit of a background. We look at coastal geology. We look at geology. We look at the origin of planet Earth. Where does the ocean come from? Where does ocean water come from? Um, we look at sediments in the ocean. Uh, we look at solutions that we find that dissolve in ocean water. We look at salinity, how saline or how salty water is. Um, we deal with water quality, such as pH, such as temperature of water, changes, what causes those changes to occur, and what is natural, what is human induced. Meteorology is an important component of oceanography. Many oceanographers mainly deal with meteorology, and some of the most successful meteorologists have come out of schools of training of oceanography. Um, there's also regions of the ocean that we look at and ocean waves and diving science. The science of diving, the science of how to keep yourself safe 
when you go diving. We deal with that to a small degree. So at this point, I'm going to hand over, stop sharing, and hand over to Xavier so that he can introduce himself. He had unmuted his video to do so earlier, and then he can explain the marine biology component to you. All right, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Russell. And um, yeah, this first year with our grade tens online has been a really interesting one. And it's given us the opportunity to engage with the content that we put together and to look more closely at what we'd actually written and um, to compile good presentations in order to be able to inspire our students and um, we can take it at a given, as a given that studying online is, is not the same as sitting in a classroom and engaging with your teacher. Um, and in the same way, being a teacher of a class where you can't actually see your pupils in the class and the reactions that they're giving you um, has been quite challenging for us. I've, I've really struggled with not having that personal interaction in the classroom and being able to see who's engaging and who needs to ask a question and who desperately needs to ask a question but is too shy to. And um, we're still getting used to that, but it, it's all very doable. It just requires a higher degree of self-discipline for those of you sitting at home working online. Um, there are going to be times where you're tired or you just don't feel like it, and it's very easy to then switch off the screen and not pay attention. And um, I want to encourage you to, if you if you commit yourself to this, to to take on the challenge of um, applying your own self discipline because this is a subject you really want to do rather than one that you have to do, and to even when you're feeling tired and a little bit drained, give it all you've got. So it's my it was my privilege to be able to be involved with the writing of the curriculum. Um, and populating the, the life sciences side of things, the marine biology, as it were. And um, I found it really fascinating to take what I've learned in the last couple of years coming into the aquarium as a biology teacher and taking that new knowledge and all of the animals around me um, and quite a bit of snorkeling and scuba diving I've been able to do with my camera to be able to get good stuff. So the course is not all about marine biology. Um, as Russell has mentioned, there is a lot of physical oceanography. There's the very important concept of how humans are affecting the oceans and things that we need to change. The ecology, which is literally the home of these animals. And, you know, we're told at high school in life science that we look at ecology and we've got something like seven or eight biomes within South Africa. And then there's the ocean. Truth be told, there are more different ecosystems in the ocean than there are on land. And it's absolutely criminal to write off the ocean as one ecosystem. And um, so we get to unpack at least our coastal ecosystems in a little bit more detail. Um, so what's in the marine biology for the next three years, if you are going to take this on? And please remember, it's not all marine biology. Um, some of the pupils this year have said, but, you know, this is physics and chemistry. Yes, the ocean, you cannot talk about the animals until you understand their environment. And um, you can't talk about the impact we're having on that environment and then on the animals unless you understand the chemistry and the broader processes. So um, we're not only teaching you the language of marine biology, we're teaching you the language of the ocean. And you're going to find you'll be able to go to university and if you do take on tertiary studies in marine sciences, you're going to understand the language. And that's very important. We are determined that the terminology is well taught and that you're reminded and revised all the time because those are the words that set you apart from people who are just vaguely interested in the sea. So we kick off, and this parallels with life sciences, with looking at life processes. But what a great laboratory to be studying life 
um, using the ocean as our backdrop. Um, we have to do a little bit of general biology. Initially, when we wrote the curriculum, this was not included because we kind of thought people will do life sciences as well. And then we were told, no, it's standalone or nothing. And so we've incorporated some of the basic general biology that you would need to know and take to you for with you to tertiary studies, um, assuming that you've done marine sciences, but not life sciences. Um, so if you do life sciences, you will find there is um, some crossing over and some um, work that you're going to cover in two different subjects. Uh, but we've tried to just do the concepts of the general biology without going into too much detail. And so we will look at um, nucleic acids, DNA, uh, genetics, the way that DNA is passed on from parent to offspring, cell division, uh, the way in which things grow and produce gametes, um, and then two very important physiological functions, respiration, the act of, of um, getting oxygen to your cells so that they can function, and of course photosynthesis because that is pretty much the basis of 99.9% .9 of the food chains on the planet. Um, and then on to more exciting things. We look at cell biology as you do in life sciences as well. And there it's to try and create a bridge to the microscopic plants and animals that live in the ocean. And there are lots of them and they're very, very significant um, in the form of plankton, but not all plankton is microscopic. So there's your first um, misconception blown out the water. There are a lot of members of the planktonic community that we refer to as plankton that are in fact a meter or two across, like big jellies. If they float with the ocean currents, they're part of the plankton. Uh, we do look at evolution because we take that as an underlying premise of how life um, came to be, came into being on the planet. And if we look at the fossil record, and there's a lovely fossil um, on a wave cut platform and a beach I visited in France, um, and the rocks were just filled with fossils. So there are lots of them. And the fossil record shows us if we to understand that the older rocks or the older fossils are much older time-wise, that life started in the oceans as very simple organisms. And over time, there's been the appearance of more and more complex animals. Not complex to be in the same environment, but complex to deal with more complex environments and other ways of feeding and um, we call them niches, either a place to stay or a food source that you're eating. And rather than compete with all the other animals, a little bit of change and adaptation gets a new group of animals that's feeding on something different and it's not competing. Um, so we do take a scientific point of view when it comes to evolution, but we deal with the subject in such a way that um, people who struggle with the concept or who just cannot accept the concept are able to explain it as a view of science that they don't particularly adhere to, but this is what the scientists say. Um, and we don't force the theme too radically as we go on into the other animals. But we certainly go from the least complex animals to the most complex as we move from grade 10 to 11 to 12. Um, where is, um, then we look at ecological concepts. It's very important to understand not only the animals and plants that we see in the ocean, but the environments that they live in and how they interact with those environments. So, we cannot study this fish here without also considering the coral um, or animals in a rock pool without considering that there are waves that are beating in that rock pool at high tide and that that rock pool is exposed to the open air and the winter cold and the summer heat during the daytime. Then we get on to the animal groups. I've mentioned plankton already. And then we start with the simplest, right down with the sponges. And simple as they are, they certainly make for some very spectacular photography when we get into tropical oceans. So from single-celled creatures, we go on to the simple multicellular ones like sponges, periphera. Then on to a group that I've just finished teaching the grade 10s now. So 
We only get on to the bigger animal groups later in grade 10. So just hang in there, it will come. And the first big group is known as the Cnidarians, and that is inclusive of sea anemones and jellies and a whole lot of their cousins that are actually in open view in the rock pools, but people don't see it or recognize it because they don't know about it. And that's one of the things I really enjoy about the marine biology side is you're going to walk out of matric being able to talk confidently about animals and plants, seaweeds that you find in the ocean. You'll be able to go and do a rock pool study, um, possibly with some younger siblings or with um, younger cousins, and you will be able to explain and unpack what's happening in that rock pool and identify animals that you've been seeing all along but not even realized that they're animals. Um, so I adhere quite strongly to the, the need for people to be able to do this course and speak with authority about what's going on on our rocky shores. Basically be able to interpret them and possibly even um, move into a career as a, um, as a ecologically sensitive ecotourism guide doing mainly um, marine tourism, either snorkeling or rock pooling. So you might not know the names of all of the animals, but you will know where to go and look in the animal guides or the seaweed guides, because you'll be able to narrow it down to one chapter or maybe two or three pages in that book, rather than paging through all of the photographs to find something that you want to identify. On to the flatworms, the platyelminthes. Again, it's an animal that if you don't know about, you very often overlook until you're watching a rock pool and you see something about the size of your thumbnail that's skating along the rock ever so slowly. Um, and once you know about them again, you're going to start seeing flatworms all over the place. After the flatworms come the segmented worms, of which there are thousands of species on our coastline, very often well hidden. But again, with this course, you're going to start learning where to expect to find them and what those peculiar honeycomb-like um, sandy structures are between the reefs. It's actually the homes of segmented worms like these. This chap is known as a wonder worm, and he can grow up to a meter in length. Onto the arthropods, certainly iconic creatures within the ocean. We generally th think of a crab or a lobster when we think of um, beach scenes, and they are in the same group with the other arthropods, including sea spiders, shrimps, prawns, barnacles, believe it or not, and many, many others. Then the mollusks. It's interesting, there should be another one. Ah, oh, there it is. Um, so those are the soft-bodied animals that have shells. And of course, because they have hard shells, they're one of the groups that are well represented in the fossil record because the shells sink to the ocean floor and they get fossilized. And here you can see the link between this ammonite over here. Uh, sorry, not ammonite. Um, it is an ammonite. And a... Nautilus. Very... Sorry again? Nautilus. Uh, Nautilus, yes, sorry. The old ones are called the Ammonites, and their modern and, uh, cousins are the Nautili. Thank you, Russell. Um, echinoderms, again, one of the iconic um, animals of the ocean. If you're not thinking of crabs and lobsters, then you'll be thinking of sea stars. Um, but again, the sea stars are only the iconic members of this group. There are also sea cucumbers, brittle stars, feather stars and a whole host of other animals that you're gonna start recognizing for what they are. Um, then we start moving into the vertebrate, vertebrate group. Um, this fellow here is known as a snot worm or a snot eel um, or a hagfish. And they are the very primitive ancestors of the sharks and bony fish that swim in the oceans nowadays. So these guys are in the same phylum as we are, the chordates, but there's an argument as to whether they should be called vertebrates because most of them don't have a backbone, even of cartilage. 
From there onto the cartilage skeleton fish, the chondrichthys, which includes sharks <clears throat> and skates and rays. And um, you know, now we're definitely moving into an area where we're no lo longer looking at animals smaller than us, but animals that are significant, significantly bigger and some which might even have us on the menu. Although, um, as we will be teaching everybody, um, we tend to think of sharks as apex predators that will eat anything, including humans, when in fact there's only a very, very small minority of shark species that would target humans. And then even amongst those, um, they have to be jolly hungry or desperate before they decide to snack on humans. And there's a lovely little video clip. And that's the joy of being able to use the aquarium as our backdrop is that so many of our photographs and our video footage comes from our live habitats at the aquarium. And that is one of our iconic ragged tooth sharks. They look awfully toothy and dangerous, but we in fact um, have a, um, uh, we allow people to come and scuba dive under supervision, of course, with the raggies, and they're completely docile. They hardly even pay attention to scuba divers in the tank. On to the bony fish, um, far more diverse in terms of size, color, shape, habitat, diets. They are the most diverse vertebrate group. And then we look at terrestrial animals, so animals that traditionally evolved to live on land. And the process required for them to be able to move onto land. So we look at reptiles, birds, and mammals. But then we focus on those that have actually evolved back into the ocean again. So they have clear land living characteristics like breathing with lungs and forelimbs with which their ancestors would have walked on land, but they have very successfully evolved to become ocean going creatures again. So we deal with reptiles, mainly um, turtles and birds of which there are lots of birds that live on the seashore and fly out to get food and others like penguins that, that spend most of their days um, hunting for food in the ocean and only roosting on land. And then of course we go on to the mammals. And again, um, once we've looked at the mammalian group and what is their characteristic, characteristic features, we then look at those mammals that have taken those features and made them very successful back in the ocean again, seals, dolphins, and whales. And we can't leave the plants out or the ecosystems that these animals live in. So in ecology, we look at South African um, coastal marine ecosystems, going from estuaries to cold water reefs, to open oceans, rocky shores, sandy beaches, kelp forests, and the incredibly diverse group of open ocean drifters that are the start of all of the major food chains on the planet. And um, why I introduced the phytoplankton is because these are microscopic photosynthesizers. And although they're not very big, there's so many of them that they are the most significant photosynthesizers on the planet, producing up to 80% of the planet's oxygen. Not tropical forests, little microscopic creatures floating on the ocean surface. And then on our beaches, seaweeds, and then even vascular plants, in other words, flowering plants that, like the mammals, evolved on land, but some of them have at least gone down as far as the banks of estuaries and tropical mud flats in the form of mangrove forests. And that will bring us to the end of our whirlwind tour of the marine biology topics. So lots to look forward to. Do bear in mind that in amongst all of that, there is also um, quite a lot of theory and the oceanography and humans in the ocean component as well.
Back to you, Russell. If you have any questions, please pop them in the chat. I'll be and I'll be happy to send an answer back to you. Thanks, Xavier, and thanks to those who did uh, send me questions in the chat. Um, we love engaging in real time rather than um, just doing things virtually like this. Um, so moving on from Xavier's section and uh, really amazingly presented and he's got some lovely ways of understanding and explaining the animals so that we can fully understand them. We then work move to humans in the oceans, the last pillar of marine sciences, the oceanography, marine biology, ocean ecosystems, and now humans in the oceans. We pretty much look at careers, the history of marine sciences research. We look at climate science, we look at um, habitat uh, destruction and the biodiversity that habitat destruction could impact upon. HIPPO is really an acronym for habitat destruction, invasion, human population increase, pollution, and overexploitation. Look at ocean acidification and a whole bunch. I've got a couple more slides to make this look much more interesting. So there's the HIPPO. We look at those four aspects that I described. One of the key answers to all of the challenges that we face is marine protected areas. Otherwise, we could be talking about the oceans and ecology in a way where it is a devastating story and a story with no successes. Marine protected areas is one of the major successes and we cover that in the curriculum. As mentioned, we look at overfishing, we look at the harvesting of marine resources, we look at marine ecotourism and different from marine ecotourism or nature tourism, ecotourism, which is a method of tourism which considers every dollar or rand that is spent on tourism is also used to contribute towards the ecology and the ecosystem that has been toured upon so that it's just not exploitive in its manner. As mentioned, we deal with climate science. What are the false pieces of information out there? What is the real climate science understanding? that we need to know. Ocean acidification. An exciting element is the harvesting of ocean energy and the opportunities that the ocean has to replace all of the terrestrial electricity generation. And then something which is a, a, a topic that Xavier is in fact very passionate about is biomimicry. How can we use the stories of the ocean and the way in which adaptations have occurred, how can we use that in our own human engineering and design? You'll see quite easily here, the subject is divided into two sections. And basically, this is what I would teach, and this is what Xavier would teach. 31 topics of the 85 topics, um, which goes from grade 10 through to grade 12. 31 topics is dealt with next year in grade 10. Assessments, we have four, one, four tests per term, uh, each term, four tests in the year. So each term we have a test, we also have a practical mark. It's been difficult with COVID to work out the practical. Um, and so we've done a theory of practical. Um, there's also a project that um, one is expected to do. And then, as I've mentioned, at the end of the year, two exam papers, paper one, paper two, 150 marks each. 
the style of our teaching and, and how we go about what we do, we tend to be inductive, asking questions, trying to get people to ask their own questions, to be inquiry-based in the way in which we deal with our teaching. And we, we endeavor to, to deal with experiential learning as our model of, of teaching. So how do you apply? You make your application online. You can see it there. If you have any uh, difficulty in getting to that, send an email to education at aquariumfoundation.org.za. I'll put that up for you um, at the end. I realize it's not actually in this presentation. Um, what we are interested in you attaching your most recent report cards. Um, you complete all the details, including your school's details and who we need to contact, who's head of academics. And as a polite thing, it's important that you just inform your school as an extra mural after school hours, you are doing marine sciences as a matric subject, starting with grade 10, then grade 11 and grade 12. And you will need to just inform your head of academics. At the end, you can either write the exam at an allocated school. Many of the adults do that. Um, they will be allocated a school where they write the subject, or you could write at your own school. Um, and the exam papers in matric will be sent to that school. Um, when you do inform your head of academics and your head of grade nine, head of grade 10 next year, you need to just ex explain that this is an eighth subject. It is conceivable, possible for very inventive and creative schools to after grade 10 and grade halfway through grade 11 for the school, if it's agreement, agreed to by the school governing body, you could drop one of the other subjects at your school. And then what we're teaching would be one of those six subjects. It, the difference is that then when your peers are going to a lesson, you would have to go to the library and that's by arrangement. And I only know of one state school that actually does that. Your school will then register marine sciences on the computer system so that your matric certificate will include marine sciences as a subject. Had a question in the chat from somebody asking um, what the logistics are. It is two hours twice a week, so a total of four hours. Excluding state school holidays, we've taken that call, and public holidays. We have got predetermined dates that we will be setting tests on. Um, it's mostly the third last week of the term. On the Saturday, we write the tests. Um, you write at the aquarium or at a location. If there are enough people in Durban, for example, who take the course, we would arrange for a venue in Durban for you to write as we've done this year with Johannesburg. We are leaning towards this course taking place Tuesdays and Thursdays next year, starting around about the 24th of January. And it'll be from Oak Reef, 1630 to 1630, 1630 to 1830. Um, I just put that in there in error. Um, so practicals will be done by a, a arrangement. And then what's important is you need to book your place um, and uh, bookings open tomorrow. You can make your application tomorrow and make your first payment as soon as possible. Um, your future in marine biology could be in a range of subjects. As I explained earlier, I won't go further into the slide um, because in essence, it's a standalone subject. You do not have to do uh, marine sciences at university. However, you can study marine sciences with us in order to do arts and go and do an arts degree, a sociology degree, a uh, science degree, a medical degree, a law degree, and I am convinced that you will benefit in all of those fields 
by having studied marine sciences. Our financial situation, the Two Oceans Aquarium opened a Two Oceans Education Foundation last year. Um, and that started in March um, 2020. The, that is this year, good grief, yes. Um, and we've had a seriously compromised financial situation at the aquarium. And hence, we have to charge for this course. And we urgently moved to online space as our income generator. So unashamedly, I say that because that's our reality. We would love to give this course at no cost or minimal cost to people, but it has become our bread and butter as to what we do. Um, what's important out of that is if there are financial constraints, there would be a, there is a process where a bursary can be applied for. Um, there are means tests for those bursaries. And so we hoping to be able to bring about a course that is most con ex um, inclusive as is possible. Right, um, questions. This was asked last year. Um, are there going to be morning lessons? we tend not to, we didn't have enough people who wanted to do a morning lesson. So that's why we've not done that. Um, is it with adults? Yes. The current course, we have somebody who's 15 years old and we have somebody who is 62 years old in the same course. It's wonderful having this balance of adults and students. I did a photography course when I was in grade 11. Um, and I ended up doing that photography course with none other than Wilbur Smith who, and his wife who did the course with me. And I always wondered when reading his books after that, um, whether he had included some plot around a photographer. Um, can this be done without attending? Um, we think it's important to attend, but if you skip a lesson, the recording will be up for you. Um, and it's, uh, it's available for you then to find on our online platform, you will find the content. There is content, we've written basically a textbook, and that will be available also on the online platform. Um, can you do it if you're over 30s? I've answered that. Are there accelerated course options? At this stage, we haven't done that but certainly in the future um, it's possible to do accelerated course options we are not going to be dealing with that at this moment what are the requirements you apply and we then vet your last report um, we are looking at your maths and your science scores hopefully you will be able to um, have adequate maths and science sco scores um, we're not going to be hugely strict on that because you do not have to do maths nor physical sciences to do marine sciences from grade 10 level, but a reasonable amount, a reasonable performance of that is required. Xavier, can I hand over to you before I read the chat? You muted possibly you you can um what do i want to talk about um are there any comments or questions you can think of that people might have not asked um oh no i've i've been answering in the background here um and quite a lot of the answers i've given are um, I heard you were kind of answering similar things at the same time. And Anzia has thankfully put the email address in the chat, I see. Okay, I'm seeing a, a very important question because we have had that come up this year. Um, will it be problematic if you have school sport at the same time? Um, We've managed for most of our students to be able to find a way around that. But, um, you know, if you discover that your 
sport is on one of those afternoons, ideally not both, um, you're probably going to find that you're under quite a lot of pressure already, and so you will struggle with the subject. But we can make a plan around that. Yeah, um, last, last year, I met with somebody who was doing provincial sport. I think don't do an eighth subject if you're doing provincial sport, yeah. but preferably do a sport from cross country to hockey or whatever, um, because I think that a balanced lifestyle is very important. Um, and having an eight subject, there are plenty of people doing eight subjects in South Africa where they manage sport as well. Okay, question about what does the practical assessment entail? Um, for this year, because we've not really been able to do face-to-face -face and hands-on practical sessions, um, we, we do discuss practical work in the theory sessions. Um, where possible, we'll show a video, or if it's something that you can do with equipment at home, then um, we'll get you to carry out the practical and um, report back or send a photograph and a little report on what you found or what happened. Um, when it gets to the practical assessment, uh, it's going to be on material that's either in the theory or that we've done as a prac and we've emphasized and said, make sure that you remember this prac or that you have it on, on record. So uh, at this stage, the practical assessments are part of the test series. So it's, it's all written. Um, or it's a prac that you do and you send a photograph or two along with a write-up of the prac and you upload that to to the learning platform that we use. Um, but yeah, the assessment at this stage is not a hands-on assessment where you come in and do a prac. It will be, um, at this still stage, it's still part of a written test series. Um, so somebody asked if you're at an international online school, um, no problem, we will arrange for you to write at a, we'll just negotiate the point. There's somebody who's in Namibia and that person, when they write their matric exam, will be writing at the South African Embassy in Buntuk. Um, otherwise, you would write at a school allocated to you. In most situations, you will choose a school, you will suggest it to the district, they will find a place <laughs> close to your neighborhood where you can write the exam. Um, for your exams, for us, uh, the Two Oceans Aquarium is the venue where we do that. But there's no point if you, at for, for argument's sake, Cape Town High, you don't um, need to write your matric at the Two Oceans Aquarium. You just simply write at your school. Um, Question about how it works in Port Elizabeth. Um, we we uh, do have students in Port Elizabeth, East London as well, and you log in online, and oh, I didn't explain, in some instances, we have got uh, an agreement where somebody who is a commission of Earths acts as your, um, your invigilator for your assessments for us. So it's a Saturday afternoon. It's somebody who you know who's a commission of us or somebody who's respected. And by agreement, we'll say, yes, we send the question paper to that person. They print it out and you sit and do it. The example is um, Joshua, who is in East London. His dad is somebody who invigilates. He goes and puts Joshua in the boardroom in East London. And his dad sits, works on the one side of the table and he sits at the other side, and he writes the paper. And then his dad scans that paper and sends it back to us, yeah. emails it to us. Um, a question about being at a private school with different holidays. There we generally follow the, it has been rather um, difficult this year because the national holidays keep changing or even being cancelled. Um, so, we try to follow the government school um, holiday times. 
and people at private schools who might have a holiday outside of that time, you basically um, go on holiday and let us know and you will catch up by um, either attending the online sessions while you're on holiday or keeping it until you get back from holiday and going over the recordings. Every single lesson is recorded and loaded in the relevant chapter um, along with all of the learning material as well. So you, um, within reason, you can miss some of the lessons. Um, and certainly if your school's on holiday and we're not, then you, um, you go on holiday anyway and you catch up when you get back. Uh, we try and arrange our assessments in such a way that you either know about it well beforehand so that you can block off that day even if you are on holiday. Um, but in extreme circumstances, we have made arrangements. It's flexible. The only yeah. one that's not flexible is your end of year exam and certainly your matric exam. That happens on the day it's advertised and you need to make a plan. And we've chosen Saturdays for those exams so that it doesn't clash with any of your subjects. You need to tell us well in advance if you are a school where Saturday exams take place and we will change the exam date so that it suits you fitting with the program. Yeah. Um, sorry, there's been an important question here. If our school doesn't offer geography or subjects required for marine sciences, um, we do not stipulate any subjects that are required for marine sciences. So you can, you can take it as a standalone subject. Hmm. Um, have we expanded adequately about the practical classes? Um, you know, it's so difficult for us to know how this will work. Ideally, we would have everybody come to the Two Oceans Aquarium and we'll have a practical plan or to Ushaka Marine World and they'll do a, a, a practical plan that we will set out. Um, but that has been one of the challenges. Life sciences as a subject for example, has stopped all their practicals. And um, so we are just subject to the, um, the conditions of COVID just at the moment. What was really lovely is this year, those who are reside in Cape Town and even Worcester, so traveling over 100 kilometers to get to us, um, we have got properly sanitized uh, a large venue, well-ventilated venue, and people and sanitizer to, to start with. And we have people spaced out writing the assessment at the aquarium. And um, if there's enough of a situation next year, we will probably get people who write the grade 10 and the grade 11 at the same time um, on a Saturday at the aquarium. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about the spaced out thing, Russell, but we know what you mean. Um, and when it comes to the terms and the tests, we're becoming very good surfers where we're surfing the COVID waves at the moment. Um, right, there are some important questions coming through. So do you, we email our applications to the email in the chat? No, don't send it to me or to Russell. Um, that goes to, Russell, can you um, pop that into the chat? What is Andrew? that? Um, um, email to whom the things. applications go. Um, the applications, you, you go to the, um, website. the website and you will find it all there. The same website you use to apply to do this yeah. online um, information evening. And um, you will see you can apply. It, the applications will be open from tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and then will adults also receive a NEC certificate? Absolutely. If you do the assessments um, throughout the course and uh, you register to write it as a matric subject, then you get an NEC qualification for that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, somebody who spoke about whether getting a report is a must. Um, we've negotiated with a range of people. We have people with learning challenges. We have people who 
have autism. We have people who have a range of all sorts of requirements and we've accommodated those people in a way where we've been able to uh, deal with their assessments. If you do not do the assessments, you cannot get a matric certificate. You have to do the assessments in order for a matric certificate to be given or a addition to your matric certificate, um, which is issued by Umalusi. The cost 7,000 Rand for the year and it in increases slightly. We decided to keep it at that because even though it doesn't cover our costs in any way, um, but it, we, we kept it as low as we could, but also um, it, it will increase each year from year to year. I'm just looking, what's the closing date for applications? Well, when we full, we're full, but uh, typically we're going to give you a couple of months and it will be great if we can wrap up all of these applications by November. Who are the teachers? Xavier and I will be teaching this course next year. And I think... Okay, um, this is probably a good question. So um, I've, I've just typed an answer, but um, the question is... Um, good heavens. The best subject choices for grade 10 to study marine biology at university. Um, any science subject that you study at a university requires that you do physical sciences and maths. I know that is, it seems terrible, but it is the way it is. If you want to go and study a biological subject at university level, uh, medicine, marine biology, zoology, botany, you have to have a good qualification in mathematics and in physical sciences. The others are um, good to have, but not essential. And I would say certainly if you're going to study biology at tertiary level, then you cannot exclude it from your high school career. So you should be doing, um, if you're looking towards marine biology or oceanography, you should maybe choose marine sciences um, or life sciences. Uh, as I say, those are nice to have, but they don't insist on them. But physical science and maths, if you haven't got those, you cannot do a science degree at university. And I can't emphasize it enough. I hate emphasizing it, but that is the reality. So um, please make sure you do keep that on your, on your curriculum list. Um, so right. I could Excellent. just add to that, Xavier, University of Cape Town does require that you do both physical sciences and math. Somebody asked specifically about UCT, hence mm. me mentioning that. You need to take all of your subjects, you've got six subjects, you add up the total of all of the scores of those six subjects, but you double maths, you double science. So... If you get 80% for maths, you don't add just 80, you add 160. And if you get 90% for physical sciences, you add 180 or whatever the, the doubled score would be. They then insist that you get a score of at least 640, I think it is. I can't remember the maths, but... Um, and. Uh, what they do then is they take that score and that is what determines your entrance into um, the faculty, um, be it, uh, but that's particularly the, the science faculty. UWC, um, so generally in, at UCT, you must get 80%. If you don't get 80% for your subjects, you will struggle to get them. Although I do know somebody who's got 75 for maths and no, it was physical sciences, and they got into the science faculty at UCT. Um, at um, Stellenbosch University, the averages are not as high, and so basically 70% you get 
you can get into Stellenbosch University as an average for all of your subjects from English, Afrikaans, or also whatever your subject's going to be right through. Vivian, I'll come to you. And then CPUT, uh, Cape Peninsula University of Technology, and UWC tends to be uh, between 50 and 65% as an average. Um, we know that people apply specifically at UWC and because they have done marine sciences or a young biologist course at the, at the, in the University of the Aquarium, at the uh, Two Oceans Aquarium, they are accepted because it's on their portfolio. Oh, somebody had their hand up and now it's gone. It was Vivian. Yes, Vivian. Do you want to unmute that? yourself and ask your question? Happy to, for you to do that, Vivian. Please unmute yourself. Hello. Yes, yes. hello, Vivian. Yes, I wanted to ask, um, after you qualify, will, will you guys provide us with job opportunities? Um, that's a very difficult question for anyone. In the future, job opportunities around particularly marine sciences um, will be determined by the economy of the time. And um, in the, the current COVID context, job opportunities will uh, are, are really scarce but whenever all of us at school will need to be thinking about applying for a career in the future and so the job opportunity for you is to make sure that you get the best marks you can form a trick then get into a um, tertiary place of learning and that should help you um, those people who get jobs straight out of matric those with initiative those that are very good with their hands and practical we know of people that have gone into the tourism industry as well as helped at a shark diving facility where there has been a, a, a job opportunity. But certainly that is um, a challenging question. It is up to you as an individual as to how you plot your course towards a career. Um, Who okay. are the teachers at the Node schools? The node schools have got teachers who are qualified um, mostly in, in zoology, but also in oceanography, some of them. And um, those teachers, we, in essence, support them at the node schools and make sure that they are, um, are able to support the, the, the nodes that they're there. Thank you, Anzio. He has... Um, Put, put up the link for the application. So please do follow uh, the chat and you'll find Anzio, who also corrected me. I was trying to speak and type and write my email address, which I did wrongly, he corrected it. We're looking at about 100 students. Uh, we had 106 students this last year. Um, What career opportunities are there in marine biology? You could get involved in, you can go and do some veterinary work. Um, a very significant and growing career opportunity is aquaculture. Um, I believe the strongest skills that people are equipped with this course is even in holiday times to join a tourism operation and to be a person who's a guide on a boat or at a rocky shore um, as a tour guide. Um, there are a host of 
uh, careers and those are dealt with in the course itself. Having said that, if I may, um, of it is important to note that not everybody who wants to become a marine biologist is actually going to end up doing marine biology. But we believe that like with many other subjects, you're doing that to expand your knowledge. So if you have an interest in the ocean, it's to your advantage to nurture, the, to grow that interest in the ocean. And it might send you out into the business world as just a very informed person, but you're going to make decisions, whether you go into law or business or the shipping industry or something else that's not even related to the ocean. A lot of the decisions you make will be guided by the life skills that you learn in marine sciences, particularly where we look at humans and human impact on the ocean, that expands onto the land as well. So we learn about our footprint on the planet and decisions that we need to take to make the planet a better place. So um, you're certainly not all going to take marine sciences in order to go to university to become marine biologists. But we do believe that the science and the skills and the, um, the study of humans and their impact on the planet will put you in very good stead to be able to study a whole lot of things further when you get to university. Um, okay, Russell, back to you. I'm just seeing a question Great. that I queried. Thank you. Um, please do email questions either to education at uh, aquariumfoundation.org.za russell at aquariumfoundation.org.za and we will get back to you as soon as we can that does end this presentation you're welcome to stay on if you feel a bit shy to ask questions um, but I really want to thank you all for your participation this evening and wish you well in the decision of whether you would take the subject and we look forward to having many of you having taken the subject next year.